Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to online uh, One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. We found that this is a 25th seminar. So let me start with some announcements. Um, as always, you can ask questions during the talk. You can either unmute yourself and ask directly, or you can write your question in this chat box, then I will read it. Um, but please note that this lecture is being recorded and it will be published in YouTube. So if you don't want to appear in YouTube, you have to be careful. Okay, so it is our great pleasure to have Roland Borschmidt in this seminar series today. And as you know, Roland is a young mathematical physicist working on a variety of topics in probability and statistical mechanics. And if you visit Roland's webpage, as I did, I'm sure that you will be first impressed by the list of his mentors and advisors. So if you haven't seen that, let me show that. Let's start from the young one, Wojciech Durek, young one, Ontario of my age, and Gordon Slade. But this is not the end. Has David Bridges, Tom Spencer, not the end, and you're critic. So, well, no, no one can have more than this. But, but if you look at Roland's webpage much more carefully, then you will certainly impressed, be impressed much more by his own activity and his own outstanding publications. So today, Roland is going to tell us about his recent work on bosonization. So please. Okay. Well. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's uh, great to be uh, speaking uh, in this seminar. Unfortunately, oh, I see there is a item in the chat. Oh, that's just the slides, okay. Um, un so unfortunately, this is my first participation in the seminar, I have to admit. Uh, it's unfortunately due to the fact that our own local seminar is running at the same time. Uh, but anyway, today that I can make an exception and so I'm glad to be here. Um, this talk is about uh, field theory in two dimensions and some of the um, uh, special features that, that can happen in two dimensions, uh, in particular the, um, the equivalence of um, certain bosonic and fermionic models. And I, I saw that uh, many uh, experts uh, on this topic are in the audience, but I will assume for much of the talk uh, that uh, you know nothing about this. And I will try to start as, as slowly uh, as I can and uh, only come to uh, our recent uh, work uh, towards the end and uh, maybe, okay, so we'll get there. So, so let me begin just um, mentioning what this is about. So as I said, this is about field theory in two dimensions. And um, uh, on the one hand, I will be considering uh, bosonic fields and on the other hand, fermionic fields but everything is going to be Euclidean. And so a Euclidean uh, bosonic field uh, for me is going to be, if, if you like a random Schwartz distribution. And um, so a random generalized function. And um, the kind of motivation you might have in mind is on the one hand, uh, statistical physics where such um, uh, fields arise as uh, scaling or as continuum limits of uh, for example, lattice models. Um, uh, think uh, the Ising field, and etc. Uh, on the other hand, these um, uh, fields are, of course, of um, important uh, relevance for qu quantum field theory, where they are where they are the candidates for the construction of uh, quantum field theory via analytic continuation and time. The by far simplest example. Um, of, of such a, a Euclidean field, a bosonic Euclidean field, if you like, are, are the, is, the, is that corresponding to free particles, um, um, which uh, is the so-called free field or uh, Gaussian free field. So this is, uh, as the name uh, suggests, it's just the Gaussian measure. Um, it, uh, um, and its covariance is given by, by the um, Green's function of the massive Laplacian. So, 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 this, uh, so, so in other words, um, uh, if you uh, evaluate the expectation of uh, phi, so phi is the random field. If you evaluate the expectation of phi of X and phi of Y uh, with respect to the massive Gaussian free field of mass M, this is the massive uh, Green's function. 
So here, if, um, um, so if, if you want to be careful, uh, phi of x is not defined pointwise, so you should be smearing against the test function and so on, but let me not um, be so precise here. Uh, okay, so, so this is the, the free field, um, um, uh, which you can define in any dimension. It has a, a fermionic um, counterpart, um, which, um, um, so let me first make a couple of remarks about uh, fermionic fields. So in some sense, uh, fermionic uh, fields are the ones that should correspond to fermionic rather than bosonic particles. Um, the analog are, uh, of the fields are maybe um, once given by Grassmann uh, measures, but for, for this talk, I will not, and I do, do not need, to, at least until the very end, to go into um, the details of this, except in one a very simple case, which is again, the one corresponding to free particles. And, and these are free um, Dirac uh, fermions. So, um, so again, so the field in this case is going to be denoted by Psi. And we can uh, take expectations, say, of uh, psi. So psi is uh, is um, is uh, has uh, is a vector value or has several components, if you want. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, the analog of the covariance in this case uh, is given by uh, the inverse of of the massive uh, Euclidean Dirac operator. So. Um, since uh, I will soon consider the case of two dimensions, let me just uh, for concreteness say what the Dirac operator is in two dimensions. Uh, in this case, you can just uh, it's, uh, write it down like this. It's a, a two by two matrix valued operator, which is given uh, by um, a constant mu on the diagonal and, um, and by the Cauchy-Riemann operator respectively, it's adjoint or it's, uh, it's conjugate uh, on the off diagonal. Um, okay, and um, so this is the, the propagator of, uh, if you like, of uh, Euclidean Dirac fermions. And um, I haven't told you, I haven't actually told you what these fermionic fields are, but for the purpose of this uh, talk, all that matters is that its uh, correlations are evaluated by the fermionic Wick rule, um, which uh, means that if you um, take a product of, of these uh, fields, uh, uh, N, uh, factors of psi and factors of psi bar with uh, evaluated at distinct points, then this is given by this determinant in terms of the, uh, of the two point correlation function. Uh, so, th so this, this is all, uh, all we'll need to know uh, for, for a while about um, uh, free fermions. Um, um, okay, let me, um, uh, let me say one more thing about them before I, I uh, I can get to the more, um, um, let, let me make uh, emphasize one more point, which I've already written here, which is that uh, we're restricting to distinct points here because um, uh, say this uh, Green's function of the Dirac operator is uh, singular on the diagonal, just like the uh, Green's function of the Laplacian is singular on the diagonal. Um, so, um, okay, uh, so, uh, on the other hand, um, the observables that are of interest are, are usually quadratic in, in the fermion. So they are something like psi alpha, psi bar beta at X. So uh, which you uh, cannot, uh, so which is not, which doesn't have well-defined correlations by, by the prescription I, I explained on the, on the previous slide. But this is uh, not a very serious, uh, singularity, it's uh, basically you can um, a wick order and everything makes sense. And for this uh, talk, it will be more convenient to instead just talk about truncated correlations. So the analog of, uh, of covariances, if you like, and, and these always make sense. Um, so for example, if we look at the truncated correlation of uh, say, these uh, two uh, squares of the field, uh, one evaluated, uh, one evaluated at x1, the other one evaluated at x2. The truncated correlation, we take the we formally take the expectation of the product of the two and then uh, divide the product of the expectations. 
And uh, well, if you do that, you see that uh, the singular terms just cancel out formally. And what remains is, uh, is, a, is an expression that makes sense as long as x1 and x2 are distinct. So, um, so for distinct points, in this case, x1 and x2, we can still evaluate the, the truncated correlations. And uh, we'll take this as the definition of the truncated correlations, in fact. Um, and, um, uh, and there's a, um, a natural generalization to, to higher uh, truncated correlations. Okay, so, um, so, but, so, okay, so what I've done so far, I've given a, a very uh, somewhat superficial and uh, uh, rapid um, introduction to um, the properties of uh, free, um, of, of a bosonic free field and of um, free fermions that, that we will need. And um, uh, next, I want to discuss uh, the um, um, the miracle, or um, if you like, of, of bosonization that happens in two dimensions. So, so okay. So let me just uh, summarize the two-point function of um, of the free field of the Gaussian free field is given by the. Uh, massive uh, Laplacian Green's function, and the uh, two-point function of massive uh, free fermions is given by the massive uh, by the inverse of the massive uh, Dirac operator. In two dimensions, um, um, so so what we'll be interested in is uh, the um, is the massless case. So we have to be a little bit careful because we're also interested in two dimensions. And in two dimensions, the massless free field does not make sense uh, as, a, as a field. Um, um, uh, one way to see this is, um, um, is if we take the um, um, massive uh, uh, Laplacian Green's function in two dimension and then take the mass to zero, well, this is um, given by, by a log, one over x minus y, but then there is a, a another term, additive term, which is something like log m, which will diverge as m goes to zero. Uh, anyway, so um, um, let's, let's, let's ignore that, uh, that uh, logarithmically divergent term there for the moment. Um, and um, uh, then, uh, so these, these correlations are given by, by, by these logarithms. And similarly, on the fermionic side, we can compute uh, uh, easily uh, what these, uh, what the, um, what the Green's function of the Dirac operator is, and it turns out that in the massless limit, it's given by um, basically one over x minus y, respectively, its complex conjugate um, on the off diagonal. Uh, so here, I'm always using, since we're in two dimensions, right? I'm always using the identification of the re of the complex plane with uh, with R two. Um, okay, so. Okay, so anyway, um, these are not the same, but it doesn't take um, infinite imagination to, to see that, well, they're also not um, that unrelated. Um, basically, um, one over x minus y is uh, the derivative of the logarithm, something like that. And uh, in fact, um, if we say, uh, instead of computing the correlations of the field phi itself, we look at, uh, let's say, uh, the derivative. So this uh, del is, again, the Cauchy-Riemann operator applied to uh, phi um, uh, viewed as a, uh, x viewed as a, as a complex variable. Um, so if we compute this um, uh, correlation of, um, of del phi x and del phi y uh, with respect to um, the massless free field. So here I'm, now, uh, when uh, assuming that we uh, uh, that basically we first computed this with a massive field and then taking the mass to zero, say, so in any way the the gradients make sense because this infinite constant is not seen by the gradients. So uh, in that case, we can uh, so that's basically differentiate the logarithm and get this um, uh, one over x minus y squared, basically um, correlation, and and then we can see that this is really um, 
um, the same as a fermionic correlation. Um, so we can take uh, this truncated correlation function of, of these um, uh, of these two fields, uh, of these two squares uh, of the fermionic fields. And um, by the prescription I showed you on the previous slides, um, this is an expression that's given just in terms of these, these off diagonal terms. In fact, it's just a product of the two. Uh, and, uh, well, it's, no, sorry, it's, it's just, the, um, uh, it's just uh, the square of one of them. So, so we, we obtain the same uh, one over x minus y squared up to a constant a. Uh, and this constant A is just something that depends on pi and, and so on. Okay, so um, okay, so um, these uh, two point functions are the same. Uh, well, this is not um, not such a miracle. And I mean, both functions are something like one over x, and uh, it's maybe not uh, super surprising that uh, you can find expression uh, defined on both sides that that agree. But uh, this relation goes goes further, and uh, so there's um, another interesting uh, field uh, whose correlations you can compute, and those are exponentials uh, of the field phi. So more precisely, e to the i uh, constant, which I will denote by square root beta uh, phi. So here a little explanation is, is needed because uh, phi is a distribution valued field. It uh, doesn't have pointwise values. Um, uh, so we have to um, say what, uh, uh, what this exponential is. Now this is, uh, is, is not terribly hard in this case because uh, we're talking about a Gaussian field and um, the Right prescription and, and basically what we're doing here is uh, what you need to do is wick ordering. Um, this is small subtlety, but um, so what these dots mean for my purposes is you don't look at e to the i square root beta phi, but you look at the same expression multiplied by this um, constant epsilon to the minus uh, beta over four pi. So what is epsilon? Epsilon means instead of taking uh, the free field of mass zero that we're interested in, we'll take a, um, a regularized version, which I will denote uh, GFF epsilon M. So there are two regularization parameters that I will add. Uh, one is a short distance one, so ultraviolet if you like, uh, denoted in blue, uh, that's the epsilon. And one is an infrared one, large distance one if you like, uh, uh, denoted by M. Um, that's the mass, and we'll take both of these. Uh, so we'll we'll compute this expectation with respect to this regularized measure, in which case there's no problem, and you can you explicitly see it's an explicit computation, and then you take uh, both of parameters to zero. So if you use this procedure, um, if you haven't seen this before, this might have been a bit quick, but you can believe me that this is something that is easy to do. Uh, uh, well, what you find is uh, you find a similar formula which is uh, um, this expression here. It's basically one over absolute value x minus y squared now uh, with some exponent that uh, depends on this parameter beta that appeared here. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so this is a computation you can again do. And again, you have something, if you choose beta to be four pi, this exponent goes away. And what you can do is uh, then you have something that looks like one over x minus y squared. And it's uh, at this point, maybe not uh, so, so surprising that you can again write this in terms of um, uh, fermionic correlation functions. And more precisely, what it becomes is um, uh, this uh, truncated correlation function of, of this fermionic field uh, psi one, psi bar one at x and psi two, psi bar two at y. Um, you can check. So these are just, uh, you know, we're just matching expressions that are all looking like one over x minus y squared or absolute values of these. Um, okay, so this is, um, um, okay, so this is a, a simple calculation that shows um, that at the level of two point functions, we can uh, uh, take a certain uh, functions or fields defined in terms of uh, our original uh, free field, namely the gradient and this exponential, and identify its two-point function with corresponding 
uh, correlation functions of, of these uh, fermions. In this case, so, so del phi corresponds to uh, psi two psi one bar in, in my conventions, uh, e to the i square root beta phi corresponds to psi one psi one bar. Uh, okay, so, but again, as I mentioned, basically I've just matched um, functions that are like one over x minus y. Um, but if you, uh, if you are a little more persistent and uh, use the same kind of ideas to compute the higher order um, correlations, you'll in fact find that all of them are the same. So, um, so the statement is this one. Um, uh, let's say we uh, look at an arbitrary product of these uh, factors of uh, e to the i um, uh, square root four pi phi, um, e to the minus uh, square root four pi phi, and uh, and then we have products of of the gradients and its complex conjugate. So they're all so here in this formula, I've all smeared them. Uh, against um, test functions, um, let's say smooth, compactly supported. Uh, this is not really uh, necessary at this point, but let me do this uh, for um, uh, later. Later will be necessary. Um, so, okay, so we can compute these kind of correlation functions of all of these fields uh, on the on the free field side. Um, in this case, uh, it's a slightly more complicated computation to do this because, I mean, there's, there's more fields, but it's, it's still a Gaussian computation. And uh, it turns out that this is equal to uh, the corresponding uh, uh, multi-point correlation function on the fermionic side. Uh, with, um, and this is true for all test functions, uh, all, um, all of these fields. Um, so basically, uh, so this is a slightly more involved uh, computation than the one I, I showed you, but it's it's still a computation. Um, basically, uh, you um, I've, I've shown you how to do the two-point functions. To do the more general functions, you need to use a few properties of how to compute um, uh, correlations of free fermions and of free uh, bosons. But uh, those are computations that are you know, very standard and, and uh, what, what you uh, have to use is that there is, you know, because of the explicit form of, of these covariances, uh, there's various relations um, uh, that are a bit more intricate than just uh, that one over X squared is equal to one over X squared. So namely it's, it's one identity for determinants. Uh, this one is a van der Monde determinant uh, sort of uh, given in terms of this product of these xi's and yi's um, and uh, similar formulas like this. So basically using formulas like this, um, you can see, you see uh, by computation that all of the correlation functions are the same. Okay, so, and so in some sense, so let me pause for a second. So what, what have we done? Uh, well, we've seen that um, um, certain uh, fields um, on the, uh, of the bosonic field, in this case, these exponentials and the gradients are equal in the sense that if we take uh, their correlation functions to the corresponding um, fields of the fermions, if we make these identifications. Um, so basically the terms of the same color are identified. And uh, so this is uh, known as uh, bosonization because well, we, we can start with the um, fermionic field psi and to compute these, these correlation functions equivalently, we could compute the above ones in terms of the free field. So it's a miracle that's happening in two dimensions. It's also, if you trace back the computations I did here, it also uses ex, um, in an essential way, the precise form of, of the covariances. So it uses the precise form of the one over X minus Y on both sides to make, this, make these identifications. If you change this a little bit, generally these identities break down. So if you regularize say the free field in any way, say by a lattice or by a cutoff, um, at short distances or in some other way or, or by a mass or another cutoff at long distances, 
you will not have uh, such formulas anymore. Similarly, if you regularize the fermions in some way, say by a lattice or uh, otherwise, uh, the formulas again don't match. So it really relies on the, um, in this case, on the precise um, uh, form of, of, of these correlation functions. Um, so it only holds in the massless case and in the continuum. Okay, um, so, so this um, roughly uh, speaking, um, uh, the first half um, uh, was this explanation of this phenomenon of bosonization in the free fermion case uh, or in the, in the massless case. Now, an observation of, uh, of, of Coleman was that, uh, well, basically, Based on on this um, on these identities, it, it's natural to expect um, a generalization, uh, which is as follows. Um, so he basically, from what I explained, it would be natural to expect that you can um, put some interaction on both models as long as the interaction depends on the fields you can identify and is the same on both sides. So if we start. Let's start on, on the, so here on the left-hand side, I've, I've, uh, I've highlighted the two uh, cases we, we know, the massless free field and the massless free fermions. So formally, uh, we may think of these as a path integral. Um, the free field would be a, like a bosonic path integral with the action quadratic given by the gradient uh, squared. And um, the free fermions would be a fermionic path integral uh, with the action given by um, by that of the of, uh, associated with a Dirac operator. Um, and now, um, assuming uh, that uh, basically uh, the going back to the last slide, assuming this correspondence that uh, basically a, a gradient of phi corresponds to such a combination of uh, so like this uh, such a combination of psi's. And similarly, that these exponentials correspond to these combinations of size, uh, one might uh, try to put an exponential on both sides in the path integral. And so formally, if you add to the free field an, an interaction term, which is uh, say e to the cosine, um, uh, with some, um, in this case, uh, let me put um, a cosine square root beta phi and uh, with a coupling constant z, and uh, the same prescription of the, how to regularize the cosine that I gave you before, you might expect that this corresponds to um, the, firm, the following fermionic path integral, which is, uh, well, um, putting in the cosine, um, uh, well, the cosine is, um, um, uh, uh, okay, so, I've, I've skipped the step here, but let me, uh, let me just, uh, I've skipped the step here, which is that of rescaling, but let me, uh, um, uh, let me just uh, tell you that if, if you just use the correspondence I showed you on the previous slides, you'll guess that these two models should be equivalent. So on the one hand side, you have the bosonic model where you add this interaction to the ex cosine interaction to the exponent. On the other hand, you have this fermionic model where you add this four field. Uh, interaction to the exponent. And so the, the first one is, is called the massless sine Gordon model, and the second one is called the, the massive Turing model. Um, and uh, more precisely, there is a relation between uh, these coupling constants just by the way I've motivated this, um, or, or, or I've, I've motivated that these should be equivalent. Uh, namely, uh, if you go through this correspondence uh, for the free correlations, uh, the coupling constant G is related to this combination one minus four pi over beta and the coupling constant mu in the Turing model is related by, uh, by this constant A, uh, which was some explicit constant to the um, constant in front of the cosine term in the sine Gordon model. Okay, and so this is basically, um, what Coleman observed in, in his uh, famous paper uh, in the 70s, I believe, um, that um, be, be, because you have these identities on the level of the free massless fields, 
you would expect that these uh, interacting models should also be equivalent. So in other words, the sine Gordon model with parameters uh, beta uh, and Z should be equivalent to the massive Turing model with parameters G and mu. Um, I will come back to uh, why this is a little bit subtle um, in a little bit, but let me first emphasize a special case if we assume this. So, okay, let me first say, I'll come back to this, but let me just say that the meaning of these right-hand sides, these, uh, you know, these singular interactions and the exponential is, 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 not, is not clear. And that's where the problems lie. And I, I'll get, get back to this, but um, if, if we uh, assume this for now, what, what this in particular says is that if we choose the coupling constant of the sine Gordon model, beta to be four pi, well then uh, this term here becomes one, uh, zero. So the coupling constant of the G of the Turing model becomes zero. On the other hand, the mass term of the Turing model mu is related to the constant Z in front of the cosine interaction. So uh, in other words, the sine Gordon model with beta equals four pi is equivalent to the massive Turing model at zero interaction, but with a mass um, given up to, a comp, uh, up to a normalization constant depending on regularizations uh, given by this constant Z of the sine Gordon model. But the Turing model with coupling constant G equals zero is nothing but free fermions, but in this case with a mass. So I'm using this notation free fermion FF uh, of mu to denote um, free fermions with mass mu, if you want. So, um, so in other words, um, while as I explained, the, um, the identities um, relied in an essential way on the precise uh, forms of the propagators, there is a way to, to, uh, to bosonize massive fermions, but that is not by taking uh, massive uh, bosons, but that's by taking uh, the si massless sine Gordon model on the bosonic side. Now, okay, so this, uh, this already uh, uh, highlights a point that I was only planning on explaining later, but um, the term massless sine Gordon model is a slightly uh, um, misleading, it's, it's sort of massless because it doesn't have an explicit mass term in it, but from a physical perspective, it's a massive model. It will, will get there. Um, the physical mass, it has a physical mass, but not a, um, not a bare mass. Anyway, uh, okay, so this is a particular, so anyway, so the uh, correspondence between the sine Gordon model at four pi with uh, massive fermions, a particular case of, of Coleman's um, correspondence, uh, good. But uh, as, as I already um, hinted at, uh, there is some, I mean, it's a little bit, I mean, uh, um, so this discussion uh, that I've uh, given you uh, should have been relatively plausible, but, uh, you know, there, there's uh, something that is, uh, that is a bit delicate, which is that these models the massless sine Gordon model and the massive Turing models, uh, they're, they're not obviously well-defined. So if you define, want to define these models, you run into the familiar problems of quantum field theory of uh, divergencies uh, for the ultraviolet contributions. In fact, these models, if we're interested in the infinite volume versions also have infrared problems. So, to just make sense of, of these right-hand sides, these measures I formally wrote down by just putting in the exponential with these interaction terms, uh, they, um, they don't make unambiguously uh, sense. I mean, there is something you need to um, um, do to interpret what, the, what, this, what these models are supposed to be. And uh, so in fact, this is, uh, 
this has a long, uh, both of these models have a long history. Uh, uh, not gonna maybe uh, go into um, uh, the um, all details of what has been done and what the status of uh, the construction of these models is, but let me just highlight that, I mean, basically on the sine gordon side, there is work starting with Froelich and Froelich Zeiler, and uh, then a couple of works by uh, Benfatto Galavotti, Nicola, and uh, uh, Randon Steinmann, and uh, Bridges Kennedy, Demokert, and then more, a few more recent ones as well. So it's been a series uh, of um, quite a number of work on constructing these models um, um, with, uh, I would say, um, 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 uh, the, okay, so the construction, let me just leave it at this, the constructions aren't complete. Um, similarly, on the fermionic side, the massive Turing model is, is a delicate model. Um, um, and there have been a series of, of works of, uh, to understand the massive Turing model. Uh, and as a matter of fact, also the massive, massless Turing model. So the massless Turing model, um, okay. So, okay, and so again, let me just highlight that there's these works starting with uh, Benfato Galavotti, Mastro Pietro, Falco Giuliani, and, and uh, uh, many recent ones as well, uh, in particular, um, Okay, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but I, I want to highlight that making sense of these models, there, there is, del uh, it's del it's, there are um, um, uh, delicacies uh, related to the fact that you need to regularize. Uh, by regularization, you lose uh, symmetries and so on. So the familiar problems of quantum field theory. Um, okay, this was a little bit of a, of a, of a crash course uh, discussion of, um, uh, of uh, what these right hand sides are supposed to be mean. There's there's one further point I want to uh, maybe mention, which is that on the sine Gordon side, things become considerably easier if this parameter beta appearing in its definition is strictly less than four pi. In this case, it's uh, basically what is uh, called uh, wick renormalization is, is all that sufficient. You just need to wick um, um, uh, um, uh, take the um, um, weak regularization of, say, the cosine to um, construct a well-defined measure. Um, on the other hand, once this parameter beta exceeds 4 pi, including in particular the value of 4 pi itself, uh, there's an, you know, higher order um, counter terms that, that arise. And uh, so if, if you like the energy becomes, inf it has an infinite energy renormalization. Um, okay. Um, so this was a, maybe perhaps a little bit vague. Um, so let me just flash briefly more precisely what we wanted, uh, how we would say, want to interpret the massless sine Gordon model. Uh, we start with a regularized version of the free field. We regularize it both at small and large scale. So there's a parameter epsilon, small scale regularization, parameter M, which is a mass, which is a la large scale regularization. And then we uh, define a regularized sine Gordon model, which depends on these parameters, epsilon and M. And also, um, and also, um, uh, another um, regularizing set lambda, and uh, it's 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 given by by this inter interaction with respect to the free field measure, and then we want to study all limits. Uh, lambda goes to infinity. That's the that's the region to which the cosine is confined. M goes to zero. That's the mass of the free field, and epsilon goes to zero, uh, which is the ultraviolet uh, regularization. Okay, and uh, okay, so um, the case we re revisited is uh, the case uh, which in some sense is maybe the, you might consider the trivial case, which is exactly this, this case of um, 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 
where the coupling constant beta becomes four pi, the massive Turing model, if you like, becomes trivial in the sense that it becomes a massive fermions, massive free fermions. But the sine Gordon model at four pi is, is still a, is, is an interacting model. And so basically what we, um, uh, the result I want to pr present is that in this case, uh, we can uh, take all limits and uh, uh, establish this identification. So uh, we look at the uh, massless sine Gordon model at four pi, fix any coupling constant there is a restriction uh, on the uh, coupling constants, which is uh, on the number of uh, fields you need to take, which is, uh, is physical. Uh, I'll come back to this later maybe, but maybe not. Um, uh, we fix any uh, sequence of non-overlapping test functions. We take the correlation functions on the sine Gordon side. And here I want to be a bit more precise because uh, since we're taking uh, now the sine Gordon model rather than the free field, these are not automatically well-defined. So I'm putting in all cutoffs, all three, and um, um, in which case the, this side is well-defined. And then what the result says is we can take all limits and the result is what you expect. It's uh, the fermionic, free fermion correlation function of massive fermions. And the mass is related to the sine Gordon mass, uh, sine Gordon uh, coupling constant. Um, so in particular, so uh, there's a few points I want to emphasize. First of all, um, the existence of the limit on the left-hand side is by no means uh, clear, and that's part of the result. And uh, in fact, um, when beta is not four pi, uh, the existence of these limits is not known. Um, secondly, um, since on the right-hand side, we're talking about free fermions, the right-hand side is explicit, right? It's, uh, you, give, I, you give me the test function and the right-hind side is an explicit expression in terms, defined in terms of uh, uh, determinant, things like that. Um, now, this is uh, not uh, the, um, our result, it's not the first result in, in this direction, um, but I think it's the first one where we can take all limits including in particular the infinite volume limit. Um, so let me mention that the first results are due to Ehrlich and uh, Zeiler. This is Erhard Zeiler, as opposed to the next result, which is uh, Rudy Zeiler. Um, anyway, um, uh, and then there's results by, uh, so these are results uh, which apply in the regime beta less than four pi where the singularities are less severe. Uh, and they require a finite volume or an external mass. The results <coughs> of uh, Nimok, which looked at the same case as ours, which is the free fermion point, but again, with a finite volume assumption and uh, in particular assumptions that uh, require coupling constants small depending on the volume. And in a similar regime, but now for the interacting uh, fermionic model, the massive Turing model, there are results by Benfatto, Falco, and Mastro Pietro. Um, so our main novelty is really that we take the infinite volume limit, in which case, um, uh, let me emphasize, these correlation functions are non-perturbative in, in Z. They're not analytic in, in Z at Z zero. Um, so since this slide is sort of um, maybe slightly overwhelming, uh, let me just highlight this in, in, in the... Um, in, in a simple case, which is just the two-point function. So we take, um, so let me just compute uh, the two-point function of the gradient, just to be concrete. So we take the derivative of phi um, evaluated, uh, tested against some function f and the derivative of phi tested at, func at some function g. And uh, so here I'm writing sine Gordon for pi uh, z, meaning that uh, we take all limits and uh, they all exist. And then the right-hand side is given by, by this fermionic expression, which uh, I have evaluated for you. It's, it's, uh, this is the following integral. Uh, it involves uh, the derivative of this Bessel function K naught. Um, I've also uh, extended, uh, so the previous statement had a technical, uh, well, not only technical restriction, but it had a restriction on overlapping test functions. So here, I mean, you, 
there's a way to ex extend this in, in this way. Any, anyway, let me not go into the details for now. But so anyway, you can comp compute this two point function. And um, uh, one of the interesting features is it, it decays exponentially, um, which of course is diff very different from the re our reference measure that we started with, which is the free field, right? Which has a polynomial or logarithmic um, for the gradient, I guess, is polynomial uh, decaying correlations rather than exponentially decaying correlations. And moreover, um, the right-hand side, or both sides, as a matter of fact, are not analytic at z equal to zero. Um, yet, um, if you go back on, you know, how the heuristics uh, were arrived, you know, we basically put in these exponentials of, of these correlation functions, assumed that the exponential was expanded into a power series and so on. So um, uh, might have expected this computation to make sense if things were analytic, but, but, they're, but they're not. Uh, okay, so, and, um, and then you can go beyond and you can also construct a measure if you want on distributions of R2. Again, this looks very different from the free field. It's singular, both at short and large distances. If you want, it's, um, it has exponential decay of correlations and uh, et cetera. Um, okay, so um, in the remaining uh, few minutes, uh, I'll try to give you um, just the slightest hint of the idea of, of the proof um, or where the, um, um, okay, yeah. So, so okay, so how, how, um, how does the proof work? Um, the strategy is basically already explained in Coleman's paper. Um, you first check the statement is true when all coupling constants are zero. This, in fact, I've, uh, well, sort of shown you. I mean, I've checked it for the two-point function, then I've shown you the basic formulas for determinants that you need to put in to check it in this case. So, these are, so when both coupling constants are zero, we're in the case of massless fermions and massless bosons. So we check explicitly it's true then. So now I've also told you that uh, since we're interested in the infinite volume case, uh, both sides are not analytic at z equal to zero. So we, we cannot hope to expand in infinite volume around z equal zero. However, we might hope to do that if we first restrict to a finite volume. So the second, part of the proof is you restrict uh, the interaction to finite volume. And in this case, um, show that the correlation functions are analytic. Um, okay, so, um, so this is also, so, okay. So this, uh, up to this point, things are, I mean, um, it's a natural strategy. And this is also, we're not the first ones to look at this strategy for this problem. So this is basically uh, what um, the previous uh, works have um, used as well. Um, one difference is that they basically used um, expansions in terms of the, this interaction. So say the cosine integrated over a finite volume in this case, and showed analyticity uh, in a ball, say analyticity of the uh, correlation functions as a function of, of this par parameter z, in a ball around uh, z equals zero. Um, uh, so this is maybe what you sort of get naturally from an expa expansion in, in this coupling constant z. Part of the problem with this is that the radius of uh, analyticity that you get. So this is this red circle here, um, uh, depends on, on the volume. Uh, it actually has to, right? because uh, I mean, I explained to you that um, uh, in, as you take the infinite volume limit, things are not analytic. So in fact, the radius has to shrink to zero as you take the infinite volume limit. 
So, so, but okay. So if you fix the volume, you have a uh, you have a finite analyticity radius, and uh, you can also show that uh, the uh, correlate that the derivatives in z. Uh, given by the formal expressions you would expect by uh, differentiating this expression I gave you for the measure. And uh, so this is roughly how the how the proofs in in finite volume um, work. Um, so maybe for for the infinite volume case, um, our main novelty perhaps is to um, that we show analyticity not in a ball but in a strip. So we basically uh, do not have a, an assumption that the coupling constant is small. For all coupling constants, we get analyticity in a strip around the real axis. So again, the width of the strip depends on the volume as it has to, because uh, as I explained, things are not analytic as you take the infinite volume limit. But for every finite volume, you have a strip that covers the entire real axis, in particular, all z. And so there is no assumption that that z has to be small, depending on the volume. Um, so this is sort of one uh, key uh, technical um, um, uh, ingredient here. And the second one is, uh, now if you go to the fermionic side, well, you need to study. Um, a um, basically a Dirac operator where the mass term is restricted by a mass term in finite volume. Um, again, uh, for if you fix the finite volume, in this case, uh, um, you can uh, not so uh, the part that's not so hard is to see that it would be analytic in a strip as well in any finite volume. Uh, that you can compute derivative, derivatives of the corresponding fermionic correlation functions, which, as I mentioned, are given by explicit expressions um, in terms of this propagator, and that these are actually equal to the sine Gordon ones. And um, uh, finally, um, on the fermionic side, uh, we can take the infinite volume limit. There's something that would be would be uh, in this regime at, at four pi hard to do on the sine Gordon side, but on the on the fermionic side, uh, we know how to take the infinite volume limit. So, but since in any finite volume they're the same, they cor uh, the, the correlation functions are the same, and they are analytic in a strip um, by um, and have derivatives which are equal at uh, at z equals zero. Um, we can. Um, use a uh, unique complex continuation to uh, extend the statement uh, to all uh, coupling constants in any finite volume and take the limit thus on both sides. Um, okay, so um, I think I'm done a, a little bit earlier than I uh, needed to, but um, this is all I, I wanted to, uh, to present. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm happy to, uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, further questions and um, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a beautiful lecture. So, any questions, comments, please? Anybody? Uh, question? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Could you hello. comment on hello? Yeah. Could you comment on where does the costelitz stavlis transition relate to this? Uh, uh, pop up in this formalism. Well, the costelitz taulis transition, I guess I don't have a... Um, so th that would happen as you approach uh, 8 pi. So in, in the no normalization uh, I have, uh, this parameter beta ranges between 0 and 8 pi. So you can construct the continuum uh, limit between 0 and 8 pi. And at 8 pi, uh, you'd have the costelitz taulis transition, and there's no way anymore to uh, take a non-trivial continuum limit. That makes sense? Does that answer? Uh, so are you, does this formalism describe the, the KT phase? No, this is in, or, the, uh, in, the, the... in the localized phase. Uh -huh. So, so it's not. Uh, so this is between zero and eight pi. So this is where the field is localized. Um, 
it's a, it's a non-trivial field in the continuum, but it has exponential decay at, at large distances. So it's not the KT phase, it's a localized phase. So the, the, dipole, the gas of uh, topological charges forms dipoles. Uh, uh, or not? Yes, or, well, that would happen above 8 pi, yes. but... Uh -huh. uh, so it's kind of a plasma of charges? Yes, this is the plasma phase. If, if you, thank you. you want. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, uh, Alessandro Giuliani. Can oh, I? Hi. <laughs> hi, hi, Roland. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, um, one is, is it possible in perspective uh, to, um, do you think you one can get in perspective uh, some information about the screening of the two-dimensional Coulomb uh, gas uh, uh, at beta equal four pi out of this? And the uh, uh, second question is whether you can comment a little bit about uh, how you, you get uh, uh, this uh, technical improvement of the analyticity in the whole uh, strip around the real axis uh, compared to previous results where you had only, when people had only uh, analyticity in, a, in, a, in the ball. Okay, uh, okay, so maybe first one, yes, I mean, this statement, if you look at these, um, at these char, I mean, at these e to the i square root four pi correlation functions, these are equivalent to correlation functions of the Coulomb gas at four pi. Um, um, okay. okay, so this uh, proves uh, screening uh, uh, in, at a point that is uh, far away from that, uh, following from the proof of, uh, well, not Bridges Federbush, but the generalization of that in two dimensions. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, and okay, so uh, the second point is, is this improvement. Uh, how do we get the analyticity in a strip rather than in a ball? Um, so basically uh, the observation, I mean, uh, how this works is, um, um, so if you think about this problem, so it's first of all, so this essentially uses the uh, the finite uh, volume uh, property um, to get this analyticity in, in the strip. Now, if if you had um, so the following uh, model might be uh, of help here. Um, if you consider, say, a lattice problem, say you put a unit lattice, and you consider a finite volume and inter cosine interaction. Uh, then you would have such analyticity because, um, because you have a, a bounded finite volume interaction. Um, and this is sort of what happens also below four pi. And, um, now at four pi, one difficulty is that you have these infinite uh, renormalizations and uh, interaction isn't bounded, et cetera. Um, so basically what we do is we uh, use again a, a similar strategy as what people have used uh, in this uh, ball before, iterate this up to a certain scale, and then use something extreme, then one can use something extremely crude uh, afterwards, which are Gaussian concentration estimates basically uh, to get the analyticity in the whole strip. Um, this may be a little bit uh, too uh, technical to explain on, on this slide here right now, but um, in a few words, as you basically iterate the procedure as before up to a certain scale, and then use some crude estimate, volume dependent um, um, afterwards, uh, depends on the volume, but since we all, all that we are interested in is the analyticity, um, that is enough. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from experts or non-experts? So here's a non-expert. So, uh, so you said that so this beta equal four pi case uh, is a difficult renormalization, right? You, the weak ordering doesn't give you the answer. You have to renormalize, and so is it is it done in the standard way, and is it easy or? Well, is, I mean, so it's part of the, so, okay. Um, I mean, so one, one uh, somewhat pleasing feature of the Sine-Gordon mm -hmm. model compared to models say like the Phi-4 field is 
that um, so the the infinite counter terms they only appear sort of as additive terms in uh, in the energy. So there would be. <laughs> um, so if you normalize the measure, you wouldn't see them. But but oh. they're still they're oh. still. I mean, so this doesn't help very much because you still need to um, mm. control them in the same way. Um, but. Um, um, oh, so that, that's why you didn't have anything like counter term in this expression. Yes, so that's why oh. you, don't, you don't see it oh. here. I mean, so if, you, hmm. if I was to look at the unnormalized measure, hmm. there's a counter term. And in fact, okay. that oh. counter term is a second order counter term in the coupling constant basically hmm. happening at 4 pi uh, that, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we treat uh, that, that comes out explicitly, but it didn't show up in this formula because it's, it's additive. So that's... Hmm. Uh, somewhat uh, pleasing difference of this model. Um, OK, thank you. <laughs> another question, if I may? Yes. If I remember correctly, uh, Jankovici and collaborators had the results about a special point for a Coulomb system, say particles in a lattice. Is what you are describing here sort of continuum limit of that? I mean, yes, this is very much related. I mean, it's it's the basic. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, it's the basic. I mean, basic identity is, is this one, if if you like, that that makes these things happen. Um, um, so it's very much related. I mean, for us, we we want to con construct this field, and uh, so in particular, what we need is. The, um, I mean, it's very much related, but on a technical level, it, uh, we're looking at so something a little bit different, right? We're looking at these uh, um, correlation functions of the field um, uh, Okay, but it, it, I mean, so say if you took a, uh, let's say a canonical ensemble, uh, um, so it would be more explicit. Okay, let me leave it at this. Uh, this is very much related to what you're saying, but uh, it's uh -huh. not the same Thank problem. You. Uh -huh. Yeah. But it, it may be capturing the scaling limit of that. Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's capturing, it's, it's the same mechanism that's in behind, except, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Did Coleman uh, have some uh, physical motivation to to consider uh, bosonization? I mean, uh, do physicists find it relevant for for something? Uh, like that? Okay. Well, let me. Um, so there, there are people in the audience who who are much uh, better qualified at at explaining this than I am. I see, for example, Erhard Zeiler in the audience. Um, so maybe let me not try to say too much uh, at the to um, uh, perhaps uh, some, uh, someone like Erhard Zeiler might, might uh, add to this uh, if he likes. Um, I mean, on the, so there, there are some interesting features from the quantum field theory perspective, uh, I believe, which is that, uh, you know, uh, it's a model where you, um, uh, so the, the classical sign Gordon uh, equation like one plus one dimension, uh, you can have uh, soliton states, etc. And uh, so after quantization, these quantized solitons are related to the fermions of, of, the, uh, of the Turing model, or in this case, at four pi, the free fermions. So, so I believe from a quantum field theory perspective, this is a very, um, I mean, there's something very physical happening. These, these fermions are the quantized solitons. But maybe I'll leave the discussion at, at this level and uh, leave it maybe to others to uh, comment further on the physics. If All right. Uh, perhaps uh, see some, uh, I, I guess Jan asked about the physical applications. Well, uh, the best one that I know about is the Luttinger model, which uh, occupies a big corner in condensed matter physics. Uh, that goes back, the solution of that goes back to 1965, which is about a decade before Coleman. Uh, and before that, there's, uh, there was multiple work, uh, I, which should also be mentioned about the Turing model. Uh, and be, before 
uh, in the early 60s and late 50s, uh, people realized that there was something funny about the Turing model and there were bosons lurking around in it. Uh, the work of Glaser, and I, I don't remember who else, but there's a nice book uh, published, I think, by World Scientific about the history of the uh, uh, Turing model, uh, bosonization, I should say. It's, in fact, that's the title of the book. Uh, but the uh, what Luttinger tried to do was uh, he didn't know about any of that history of the Turing model. He he just knew about Tomonaga, and uh, he uh, tried to invent a model that would uh, uh, give the results that Tomonaga had predicted uh, for uh, fermions in one plus one dimension. Uh, he invented this model and uh, it was not, solved it, but he gave the wrong solution. And uh, in 65, uh, Mattis and I found the right solution and uh, realized that the whole thing was a, a model of, uh, looked at the right, from the right perspective was a model of bosons. So that's where bosonization starts in the condensed matter literature. Uh, and uh, well, I don't know what else to say except the, to put in physical uh, terms what uh, Roland said, uh, that you have to deal with this model very precisely or you get the wrong answer. Uh, with all these uh, uh, um, equations written in all these beautiful slides, and by the way, I want to say that Roland gave a beautiful talk and uh, covered a tremendous amount of territory very nicely. Uh, thank you very much for it. Anyway, um, the, in, in, uh, what you have to remember to do is think of fermions uh, in one dimension now, one plus one, but uh, one dimension space. Think of fermions as uh, 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 occupying uh, points along a line, uh, ind indexed by momenta. And what you must not do is cut this off, this, these uh, available states of the fermions at any finite distance, at any finite point. You have to let it run all the way to minus infinity. In other words, the Hilbert space that you're easily misled into thinking of is the space where you start with <clears throat> no fermions at all and you add finitely many fermions uh, and take the closure of that. That is not the Hilbert space you want to be in. The Hilbert space you want to be in is the one where you have all the negative energy states are occupied, the positive states are not occupied at all, and then you start making finitely many corrections to that and take the closure. That is the right Hilbert, correct Hilbert space. It is a big difference between the two. Uh, from a physicist, this is a hard concept to to swallow, but because you always like to think that the the limit of the former is the latter, but it isn't. And uh, if you take the Hilbert space that I just mentioned, then you end up with excitations uh, that are quite uh, actually quadratics in the fermions, and these behave like bosons. The commutation relation of quadratics and fermions are bosons, but if and only if you allow the fermions to run all the way. So that's a sort of simple-minded uh, perspective on what Roland was uh, saying. Anyway, that goes back to 65, and uh, I just thought that should be mentioned because that is a physical application that is very much considered. And that's exactly what all these things are what Roland is talking about from the condensed matter perspective. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Elliot. Thank yeah. you very much for the beautiful mm -hmm. explanation. Yeah, that's very nice. So probably it's it's a good time to thank Roland again for a beautiful lecture and thank everybody who joined the seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>